boogie player, my choice to the nations. I will shout for joy in the congregation. I will worship God, worship God all my days. Those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in Him justify. Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Neighborhood Church. Uh, it is so great to have you joining with us this morning. Um, as we get into our service today, uh, let's focus our worship uh, together on these words from Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Well, as we continue to worship this morning, to keep these words in your thoughts and minds as, as we continue this morning, uh, but also just want to remind you as well, I mentioned last week, uh, that that verses readings like this uh like we've just listened to psalm one uh i've got those and and many more up on our channel under a playlist called worship through the week uh, and just encourage you guys to take some time uh apart from today uh, as you go through your week whether you're sitting at your desk at work uh in your home or cleaning your house or or whatever you can do uh to just Put this up, put the, this playlist up on your TV uh, or your phone and let it play and, and just take some time as you're doing your work through the week and just worship God uh, in this way. So take that time this week uh, and I just want to encourage us this morning, we just want to open in a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you so much for your word. Uh, God, for the blessings that you give us through uh, scripture. And so we just also want to return that to you today. And we just want to bless you with our worship, with our praise. And, and thank you so much, God, for the gift that you have given us, uh, not only with your uh, love and compassion and, and freedom from our sin, uh, but also the gift that you have given us in the church uh, and, and that we can be together and, and worship uh, your name as a group um, and not alone. And so we just pray uh, these things in your name today. Amen. guys are having a great week. Um, I have a couple of announcements for our kids. So this past Monday we had our first kids club following our mystery unit. Um, so there was just an introduction into what we're going to be looking at in regards to God and science as well as we started our mystery. Um, there is a missing dog. His name is Teddy and he was last seen at 4 p.m. in Mrs. Higgins backyard. He was stolen and so uh, kids are going to be looking at what evidence was left behind and how to come to a hypothesis on who might have taken him. Um, so yeah, if you guys are interested and haven't joined us last week, feel free to send me an email. Um, if you guys were with us last week, I will send you an email today with the link. Um, our lesson for this week is on the story of Abraham and Sarah. Um, so I want you guys to think about the last time you laughed. And not just had a little chuckle, but like you really had a good laugh. Maybe uh, your sibling told you a joke that was funny. Or, I don't know, maybe you dropped something and you had a good laugh. Um, I know for me, I was on the phone with a friend the other day. And um, we were laughing pretty hard about some silly things. So in this story, Sarah finds out um, that she's going to have a baby 
God tells her husband that they've been faithful and so Sarah will have a child and she just starts laughing. And you might think that's kind of silly. Why would she, why would she laugh about that? But Sarah was 90 years old. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know anybody who's 90 years old right now who's expecting a baby. It's a little bit not common for that to happen. Um, so Sarah laughed and this was God's response to that laugh. It says, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I, re I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. And so in our story, we're looking at how, you know, nothing's impossible with God. and God does keep his promises. He promised Sarah that she would have a son and Abraham as well. And a year later that that happens, God fulfills his promise. So if you go onto our dig in page, you can get the full lesson um, as well as on the Flipgrid app. I will post a little object lesson for you. Um, and any of you, if you have family or um, friends who are interested in doing the kids club, um, but that time doesn't work for them, I will also post a little um, mini kids club for you on the website as well as pages that you can print out. So take a look for that. Um, yeah, and we'll just pray for our kids. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, um, to watch the service. Um, it's much different than being together, Lord, but um, I'm grateful that we have the technology and the ability um, to, um, to watch your word and um, to learn in this way, Lord. Um, I especially pray for the kids um, in this time, Lord, as they're at school um, and with their family and friends. It's been a challenge, Lord. Um, I thank you for all of our students um, who, who have come to Kids Club, Lord, um, and just the opportunity that it's been to be able to connect with kids um, that maybe live far away, that maybe can't um, attend regular church services with us, but um, doing a Zoom is something that is workable and doable for them, Lord. So I thank you for that opportunity to minister um, for them, Lord. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. So I hope you guys have a great week. Um, and I just have a um, message of prayer. A family um, that attends our kids club. They've had a baby um, just recently this past week. So if you could be praying for them, that would be fantastic. Um, I hope to see you guys soon and we'll catch you later. Bye. I want to add my very warm welcome to our online worship service. Thanks for tuning in to Cornerstone Neighborhood Church in this virtual format. Uh, we want to say thank you so much for those who are participating financially in these days. Thanks for your giving, whether you're using the online opportunities or if you have a gift that you need picked up, just contact the church office and we'll, we'll take care of that. As we're thinking about giving, I want to let you know about our Cards and Care project for the month of March. Now, this sounds very similar to Christmas because it is similar. We are once again collecting grocery cards specifically from Superstore in order to contribute to Webster's Corners Elementary School. And the staff there has opportunity to care for families in need. And so this is a wonderful way for us to be involved in our community. Details are on the website. Speaking of schools, today we want to give you an opportunity to just have a little peek into what God is doing at Maple Ridge Christian School. Uh, currently, we don't have any uh, children from our church family uh, studying at, uh, at MRCS, uh, but we do have uh, one staff member there. And so uh, we want to uh, give you an opportunity to see uh, what is happening there in the area of Christian education. Have a look at this. This is Maple Ridge Christian School. This is where I've been going to school since I was in kindergarten. Over the past 13 years, I've spent more time here than anywhere else. This school is my world, and I share this world with all of the other students here.
Okay, so areas of our world have seen better times. These portables were already used when they came to the school over 20 years ago, and now they've definitely reached the end of their lifespan. All of the classes that meet out here, grades four, five, six, and seven, as well as all of the music and drama classes, need a new home. And this gym was built when MRCS was just an elementary school. Since the high school started back in 1995, we haven't had enough space for our high school athletic programs. So my basketball team has our practices and home games here at the local rec center. Our high school athletic teams need a home at Maybridge Christian School too. So guess what? We have found a way to meet all of the needs of our academic, arts, and athletic programs. We are going to complete a building project that will transform our world. This is what the new high school gym will look like. It'll have bleacher seating and a curtain wall that can divide it into two usable spaces. There's even a bonus weight room above the new change rooms. And this is where grades four to seven classes can come home to. Brand new classrooms that have movable walls between them so that they can be set up for a single class or multi-class use. These flexible spaces will open up worlds of opportunity for collaborative and individual learning. This is what the new music room will look like. A big open space that can accommodate the choral and band classes so the choir risers and the full orchestra can be set up at the same time. Right above this room is another one of equal size for the drama classes. We will have new spaces to connect like this dual purpose staircase. The staff will be getting a revamped staff room as well as a badly needed office space. We'll all get more washrooms and storage areas. We'll be optimizing every corner of our new school. This amazing space is called the Grand Hall. This area can be used as a social space, a teaching environment, and a meeting spot. There are so many possibilities. It's a multi-purpose hall that will open up options during the day and can even be rented out at night. And the improvements are happening outside as well. For the first time, we'll have a full-size soccer pitch for our field teams. There's a new playground off to the side of the field and an extended covered walkway along the school that will provide outdoor opportunities for those rainy days. This all sounds really exciting, so I'm sure you're wondering how much it's going to cost. We need $10.5 million to make all of these projects happen. The school already has some money saved, but it won't cover all of it. We are relying on organizations and people like you to get us to the finish line. I know it sounds like a big ask, but I can tell you, it's worth it. This is the place where we learn about Jesus and worship Him together. This is where we explore new concepts and expand our minds. This is where we strengthen our relationships with our friends and our teachers. This is our world as we know it. But soon we'll go from here and do amazing things out there. We're getting ready to be your service providers, your missionaries, your stewards of God's creation, and so much more. So why don't you change my world? Change my world. 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 So I can change yours. Well, I want to lead you in a few moments of prayer. And let's just bow before the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you are doing in the lives of young people at Maple Ridge uh, Christian School. We're thankful, Lord, that they can have an education that comes from a biblical worldview. We think of some of the challenges that we have in our society today to thinking uh, biblically, to thinking according uh, to Christ. And we pray that we would be respectful, thorough, um, compelling witnesses of the truth of God's word in our community. Help us, Lord, to care. Help us, Lord, to think about those who are in need. We, we think of the cards of care opportunity. We have just something so simple as contributing grocery cards uh, to those who may have need. And we pray, Lord, that would be one of many expressions of our care and love uh, within the, the city uh, where you've placed us. We think of this time of Lent, these weeks leading up to Easter. May these be meaningful um, moments for us as we reflect on what it meant for you, the, uh, for you Lord Jesus, to, to walk that pathway uh, to the cross and ultimately as, 
Uh, we celebrate your resurrection in April. We pray that it will have not just um, meaning and and uh, impact on our on our thoughts, but in our actions, in our lives, in how we live each and every day. We pray that you would receive the glory as we gather together in this way today. For we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield was a theological professor at Princeton Seminary from the year 1887 to 1921. Now, he's a great writer of theological books, but I have not read any of his books. 
Yet this week as I came across a very short three-line poem written by B.B. Warfield, I thought, wow, what incredible amount of theological truth is packed into these three short lines. He said this, A Christless cross, no refuge for me. A crossless Christ, my Savior not be. But, O oh, Christ crucified, I rest in thee. Now, if you're following in your copy of the scripture as we study today, we'll be in the book of Mark, chapter 8, and today we're beginning at verse 27. As you know, our current series is called Follow Me, the Call of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. We have been selective in the sections of Mark that we've been looking at. We began with a consideration of the launch of Jesus' ministry, that naturally flew, uh, uh, then flowed into um, considering the way in which some people responded positively and some very negatively to Jesus. We saw his use of parables. Parables are those simple, very accessible stories that are extremely full of spiritual content. Great way in which Jesus taught the people. We saw miracles, miracle of healing. Not all of them, but, but we certainly studied one. We saw the miracle of uh, stopping the storm, just bringing the wind and the waves to silence. And then, of course, we saw uh, the, in our last study how Jesus took a meager lunch and multiplied it uh, to, to feed so, so many people. Well, today I want to pick up the story at Mark chapter 8, verse 27, and I want to read what I think is a good introduction or a little preamble into our main text for today. Let's read verses 27 through 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Jesus answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Well, what were the crowds saying? Who, who did they understand Jesus to be? I think they misunderstood they uh, were divided in their opinions. The disciples were picking up on mixed messages of who uh, the crowd understood Jesus to be. Some were thinking of the promised one to come, the, the Elijah one uh, that was promised in the Old Testament. Perhaps he was one of the great prophets come again, maybe was in some of their thinking. Uh, certainly some were um, very mistakenly connecting him with John the Baptist. Well, now, what were the disciples saying about Jesus' identity? We know from Matthew's comment that what Peter said here, you are the Christ, was in fact uh, revealed to him by the Father. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 17. And I think uh, inasmuch as Peter was saying the truth, later we'll, we'll realize this hadn't fully penetrated their understanding. I think Peter was really, in many ways, speaking on behalf of the group, saying, well, we think you're the, the, the promised Christ, as the Greeks would have said it, or the promised Messiah, as we receive that word from Hebrew. But their understanding was not full and complete. And so I think that uh, leads us to see at least some reason why Jesus would tell them, Shh, just don't tell anybody. Though it was a profound revelation, it was not fully comprehended or understood or internalized in the lives of these disciples. And Jesus did not yet want them to teach people about his true identity, for he was still in the process of revealing God's plan. So we pick up the story at verse 31, and I want to read for us this story, very fascinating. And then uh, I want to share uh, three things that we learn about the cross of Jesus from 
his comments here. Mark chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 31 to 38. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. He then called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The first thing uh, I think that we have to reckon with is living in the shadow of the cross. Now, as I said, this verse, verse 31, marks a pivot point in Jesus' ministry. I think it's discernible here in Mark, but it's certainly vivid in the book of Matthew. If you turn to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, there's a little phrase in the original language that simply means from that time. And it's a small little phrase, but it's significant because at that point, it is uh, Matthew's way of saying, now Jesus enters his ministry. And then in Matthew chapter 16, which is telling the same story as we're reading here, Matthew again and only uh, on that second occasion uses that small little phrase to once again from that time. From that time, Jesus launched into his ministry, and now from this time, Jesus is moving away from ministry, and he's setting his course to the cross. What was he signaling? He was signaling a profound shift away from ministry to his ultimate mission of suffering and death. In fact, he said, the Son of Man must suffer and die. That's in verse 31. We could almost say it's an absolute necessity for me to die. This is what Jesus was trying to communicate. And this was not the only occasion. Over in chapter 9, verse 30, 32. Uh, in chapter 10, verse 32 to 34. Now bear in mind, Jesus was not a defeatist here. He was uh, clearly and plainly or very frankly, we could say, uh, verse 32, he spoke plainly or frankly. He was talking about his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. So all of that work that he would do was being explained. But what did the disciples hear? Did they hear about resurrection? They heard about the suffering and death. Uh, Peter's rebuke, I, I, I still can't believe, uh, I think it's such a profound um, uh, comment about humanity as we see him, as we see us in Peter, you know, that he would rebuke or push back against Jesus' divine mission because he didn't understand. He didn't quite connect the suffering to the victorious resurrection. And so all of what they heard was that their plans and, and um, hopes and dreams for uh, their leader, their rabbi, their teacher um, was going to end in great disappointment. So Jesus in turn rebuked Peter. And as he did, he said, Peter, you don't have God's frame of mind. You don't have God's thinking. You have human thinking. Literally, that's what Jesus said. You're thinking humanly. You're not thinking about God's eternal plan of redemption. 
In Mark 9, uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 31, 32, again, Jesus spoke of his, his death, suffering and death, his resurrection. And it says there, Mark makes this comment, they didn't, his disciples did not understand and they were too afraid to ask him. So not only did they not understand, but what is this fear that would keep them from saying, Jesus, help us understand? I think this fear was rooted in the fact that they had blinders, spiritual blinders on their eyes towards what they thought Jesus should be. Backing up to uh, the comments of the crowd and the only partial understanding, I think, of the disciples in who Jesus, in fact, was, because who he is is, is um, completely connected to what he would do in his death and his burial and his resurrection. So here were the disciples living in the looming shadow of the cross. And they were not yet, they soon would be, aware of how wonderful and how amazing the grace of God that Jesus would die on the cross for our sins and provide full payment for our atonement so that we, uh, by virtue of his victorious resurrection, would be given new life. He has secured salvation uh, from sin for us. If we're a follower of Jesus today, we don't live in the looming shadow of the cross, but the shadow of the cross uh, casts its reality and truth across our lives. Jesus died for us. He died willingly and victoriously. Remember what he said on the cross? It's finished. I've completed the work of salvation. We don't only live in the shadow of the cross, but Jesus is also, uh, what he's communicating in this story, tells us that we live in the significance of the cross. Now, thinking humanly, the disciples were envisioning Jesus as a victorious political uh, conqueror. Some might have had a more religious, moral aspiration for Jesus' kingdom. But nevertheless, they didn't understand uh, um, that he came to serve. Oh, otherwise, would, why would he have to say clearly, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come for my glory. I came to serve. In fact, in Mark 10 and 45, Jesus said, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. What is the significance of the cross? Well, most pointedly, the cross is that uh, point in all of human history when Jesus solved uh, the sin debt problem of humanity. Sin's ransom price was paid by his broken body and his, his shed blood. But Peter goes on to talk about the implications of that or the ongoing significance of the cross as it relates to followers of Jesus. In 1 Peter 2 and 21, we read this, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, that word that Peter chose to use there, an example, has to do with something uh, that is to be copied, something written or maybe a model to be copied. And so in some manner, we are to, to live out the significance of the cross. Jesus made it pretty clear what that significant uh, call is on our lives because of the cross. This is what he said in verse 34. If anyone would come after me or if anyone would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Following Jesus means a denial of self, really a betrayal of our self-interest in favor of um, interest in Jesus, interest in the things of God, a following of who Jesus is. Now, many people have erroneously understood this phrase, bearing one's cross. Have you, have you used this yourself? Maybe you've heard someone. Maybe someone has said, oh, I live with a very messy spouse, but it's just my cross to bear, right? Or maybe there's someone out there who's 
too small or too tall or too wide, or maybe we should leave it at that. And, and they say, well, that's just my cross to bear. We're not talking about some circumstantial experience when we talk about cross bearing. For the people who were Jesus listeners in this story, there was going to be no confusion for them. When they heard about cross bearing, they knew that was about execution. The Roman practice of crucifixion was rampant. Uh, the people knew what it meant. When they saw someone carrying a cross, they knew that person had been sentenced to death by the Roman authority, and they were on their way to the place of execution. So cross-bearing is about dying. And in the truth of what we learn throughout Scripture, it's dying to ourself, dying to our old nature and becoming alive in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, wrote this. If we have watered down the gospel into an emotional uplift, which makes no costly demands of us, then we cannot help regarding the cross as an ordinary, everyday calamity, one of the trials and tribulations of life. But when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now, this is what we learn in scriptures, uh, such as Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, that in fact, a death to our old self and a new life in Christ is, uh, if you will, a co-crucifixion. Just as Jesus literally died on the cross, we are spiritually joined with him in dying to our sinful old life and being made alive because of his resurrection to new spiritual life. And so that is why B.B. Warfield's poem is so powerful. If Jesus had not suffered and died on the cross, all that, that we're left with is some empty, unattainable moral ideal. Without Christ on the cross, my sin debt remains unpaid. And I'm without hope. But Jesus calls us to a complete identification with his complete fulfillment of God's plan of redemption. His death, burial, and resurrection makes this possible. So to take one's cross and therein say no and deny one's old self life is to accept that new life in Christ. Ellie Maxwell put it this way in his book, Born Crucified. In order to have life, we must be joined to Christ. And we can be joined to him only in and through his death. Well, there's one further thing that I think Jesus explains, not only in the significance of the cross and what he's called us to do. Uh, he, he does a masterful job, as always, in his teaching of of posing those questions that just hit us right in the heart. What good is it if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? You can amass all kinds of human wealth and power and prestige, but in eternity, you're lost. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? So he's, he's driven home with this, very crude but very understandable message of the cross that we must die to our old sinful life and by faith accept what he has done in his finished work on the cross and thereby uh, be forgiven of our sin and granted by his grace and mercy new life in him. So that's the significance of the cross but this also then will result in uh, us living in the shame of the cross. What, what do I mean by that? Maybe the most blunt way of saying it is that the cross costs. It costs. Crucifixion cost Jesus dearly. It cost him his life. Crucifixion cost Jesus the giving up of his privileged position in heaven to come to this earth, to become a servant, to completely empty himself of all 
personal um, pleasure and 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 uh, privileges and and, uh, and and take on the form of a servant, a servant that would die the most excruciating and humble death. That's that beautiful song celebrating Jesus' sacrifice for us from Philippians chapter 2. And what we experience then as those who identify with the cross of Christ is that there will be some shame that, that we experience. Now, it is important not to miss identify the suffering or the difficulty that we experience as Christ's followers. For example, some might uh, refer to a, a, a general suffering and say, this is, this is because I'm a Christian. But I, I want to remind us that as uh, Matthew 5 verse 45 tells us, uh, there are experiences like um, bad weather <laughs> or, um, or uh, experience of, of famine perhaps, or something significant in our natural world that is going to be the experience of everyone, whether they're a follower of Jesus or not a follower of Christ. So there are uh, aspects of suffering and difficulty that are common to all uh, uh, humanity. There's also suffering that comes because we failed, <laughs> because we sinned. Uh, we can't say, oh, I'm bearing the shame of following Jesus, when in fact we've sinned and we're experiencing the consequence of our sin. I remember in Bible camp, uh, a character named Scotty. Now, his real name was Alex Sutherland from Scotland, a diminutive but powerful teacher. He was our Bible teacher at camp when I was a little kid. And I'll never forget, I would stand up in front of us, and I, I still hear his Scottish accent when I read certain scriptures that he had us memorize. But I always remember the phrase he said, boys, you canna sin and win. You can't sin and then expect not to have consequences. So we ought not to sin and then suffer because of our sin and then misidentify that as the shame of the cross. Well, what is then the shame of the cross? I would define it this way. The shame of the cross is that opposition which Christians experience because non-Christians stand opposed to all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has accomplished. Now, we know that there are brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for their faith. Um, ministries like Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors help us understand the plight of so many Christ followers today not uh, not in the Middle Ages, but today, who just for following Jesus face alienation from family, beatings, imprisonment, and even death. And though it's different, I think we can identify suffering, or let's call it the shame of the cross here in Canada in our own context. It might not be lethal. Sometimes it's legal. Sometimes it's philosophical. But I want to give you just two examples of what I've noticed as some uh, shame of the cross, which comes uh, against us as those who want to follow Jesus. How is faith attacked in Canada today? Faith has been attacked first, uh, first of two examples. There are others, but just two examples. First, faith has been um, privatized. You, we live in a, in a, a society and a culture that sees faith as something that is completely legitimate for the individual, not for society. It's okay for the individual if that's your belief. And as long as you keep it private, which means don't let any of your belief system ooze out into the public sector or the public sphere, as long as you keep it privatized, okay. Well, what has this resulted in? We live currently in pandemic conditions. What is seen as essential? Uh, the economy is seen as essential. Um, construction, um, retail, restaurants are seen as essential in our society. But Christian worship is seen as anything but essential. And under the guise of um, health regulations, we're seeing the result of privatization of faith lived out in uh, the perspective of 
many people in our society, but also our, our government officials to uh, the matter of uh, uh, Christian worship, gathering for worship. Um, we could say much more about this. Uh, I, I would encourage you, if you are struggling through this, praying through this, please contact me. I have uh, several uh, resources that might help you in your praying or if you are uh, being led by God for some letter writing. Um, we want to be re responsible, respectful responders to um, this inequity in, in our society. But what it comes down to is that when a society has philosophically said, no, we don't like the gospel, um, but if that's your thing and you keep it private and don't bug me about it, yeah, okay. That's called privatization. Another is uh, issue, I think, I'll call it, you know, marginalized faith. Uh, there are other influences, but let's call it marginalized. And this is the idea that Christians who hold biblical convictions are branded as haters simply by holding a view opposed to mainstream liberal values. That is the marginalizing of our faith. That is a, 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 a large or at least influential group in our society saying, these are our values. They're not gospel or biblical values. And ironically uh, and tragically, we live in a society we, Canada is espoused to be or uh, believed to be a pluralistic society that we are tolerant and we embrace ideas from many different people, as long as those aren't biblical or Christ-like values. And so, uh, again, uh, the opposition may not be lethal, but it is insidious in its philosophical roots relativism, marginalizing, um, even, even the ab absurdity uh, of how pluralism has been allowed to run amok, and even um, opposition to biblical values is being written into law uh, because of the opposition to Jesus. And we could call that the shame of the cross. We could talk about more examples, I'm sure that you're starting to think just from these two examples of others. But what are we to do? How are, to, how are we to respond? How do we remain unashamed in, uh, in this world? How do we remain, as Jesus said, don't be ashamed of me and the gospel? How, how do we live that way? Mark 8.38 doesn't say specifically you should have hope because Jesus is going to come again. But this is the what is hinted at in this last verse. When uh, Jesus comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So we must have hope. But until that day when we're taken to our eternal home, how, how should we function living in the shame of the cross? I've got four brief thoughts for you to think about. First of all, let's realize that through this difficulty of, of opposition that we're experiencing, this means we're participating in the mission of Jesus. If you're jotting these verses down, I, I would encourage you to, so you can visit them later, or you can go to Digging Deeper and see the references. John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said to his disciples, if you get opposition, do you know why? Because they're opposed to me. They're pushing back against my mission of redemption. And so you are going to suffer the shame of the cross because of the mission of the gospel. And so when we are suffering the shame of the cross, let's remember, we're participants in Christ's mission. This is part of what it means to serve him in this world. Another uh, aspect of suffering and going through the shame of the cross James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 is transformation into the character of Christ. Participation with the mission of Jesus, transformation into the character of Jesus. As we go through these experiences, it's going to shape us and mold us to be more like Jesus, which may in fact bring more opposition as people keep seeing Jesus presented to them and they keep opposing and yet, what a, what a glorious reality that we can 
um, learn to be more like Jesus. We're, we're transformed by the Holy Spirit as we respond uh, appropriately to difficulty and suffering in our lives. The third thing that I would suggest to you to consider is that we can experience celebration in the grace of Jesus. Paul talked at length about the difficulty of sharing the gospel, the opposition, the suffering that came uh, to him. Uh, often it was physical, um, but certainly uh, 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 opposition to his preaching and teaching the gospel. And he celebrated the fact that when he was in those weak places, he could experience and, and, and um, reveal the amazing grace of Jesus through his life, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 9. And then lastly, I think one of the very practical things we can do is take inspiration from the suffering of other followers of Jesus. In my youth and young adult years, I uh, was privileged to read a number of books, hear a number of stories of um, dedicated followers of Jesus Christ, people who did not uh, give in to the shame of the cross, but in fact suffered greatly imprisonment, um, rape, torture, uh, and, and certainly a number of those stories that I was reading actually were documenting the death of missionaries and servants of God simply because they were proclaiming the gospel. And, and those those people's testimonies have inspired me. Just one, Jim Elliott, whom many know from the 50s, uh, died along with four of his missionary colleagues in Ecuador. Their deaths prompted many, many young people throughout the world to say, I want to give my life uh, in service for God. Participation with the mission of Jesus, transformation into the character of Jesus, celebration of the grace of of Jesus in our lives, and then we can take inspiration even when others uh, who are following Jesus have suffered. First Thessalonians chapter one and first second Thessalonians chapter one document uh, that happening in the New Testament era. Well, let's draw our thoughts to a conclusion, and again, I refer you to digging deeper if you want to look at some of these notes or links to Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors. Let me just pose this thought. If you have come to think that just by getting rid of suffering and difficulty in your life, therefore you're going to have meaning in life, I simply submit to you, if you haven't discovered it already, you're going to be severely disappointed. You're going to be terribly disillusioned, especially if you think that coming into a relationship with Jesus is going to solve all your problems. I hate to break it to you, but Jesus himself promised in John 6, verse 33, I've said these things to you that in me you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's remember that uh, this opposition that we see in the world comes because the cross costs it cost Jesus everything to purchase our eternal victory. And in doing so, he has made even our suffering meaningful. As we do not give in to the shame of the cross, but we, we still proclaim him, we still live for him, even though we're opposed because we know he is, he is the hope of eternity. This idea of going through the Christian journey without difficulty and, and without somehow bearing um, up in, the, in the, um, the, the shame or the significance of Jesus' cross, I don't think it's more eloquently expressed other than Amy Carmichael's poem. With, and and with, this, with these few words, I, I would just like to close. Maybe you want, might even want to just... Bow your head, close your eyes as you listen, because these are profound questions in this poem. Hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers, spent. 
leaned me against a tree to die and rent by ravening beast that compassed me. I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound nor scar? close out our service this morning, I uh, want to remind you of these words uh, from our sermon from Mark 8, 34 to 35. Then he called 
the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me, for the gospel, will save it. As we go about our weeks this week, uh, I want to encourage you to take up your cross. Uh, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Um, it's just part of our walk as believers. Uh, so I encourage you to do that today. I uh, just want to give you a... During the month of March, our nominating team invites you to prayerfully consider someone you might nominate for serving on the leadership team. Please remember that only members in good standing are eligible to serve on the leadership team. In April, the nominating team will interview the nominees. Once they've been affirmed by the leadership team, the nominees will be announced and then affirmed at the annual general meeting at the close of May. If you are a member of Cornerstone Neighborhood Church, an email will be sent to you of current members along with the nominating form. If you have any questions, please contact one of the following members of our nominating team, Sarah Chapin, Norm Knuff, Pat Hayward, Pastor Brent, or myself, Guy Kramer. Thank you. I wanna give you a few announcements before we head out today. Uh, again, a reminder, uh, gift cards, uh, we are giving to Webster's Corners Elementary School. Uh, there are some families in need in their school. Uh, and it is a wonderful blessing for us to be able to uh, to bless those families in their school uh, as well as to partner with their church and to build uh, a strong relationship uh, and show their school uh, God's love uh, through this way. So I encourage you to get your gift cards into Brent uh, before Easter and we will give, uh, for Easter we'll be giving uh, their, their school a, a donation of uh, of these gift cards to help their families. Uh, coming up, uh, starting later in the month here, uh, March 27th, we'll be having our men's breakfast uh, as, on Zoom. Uh, so make sure, men, you tune into that. Uh, an email will be coming out, uh, reminding you with, also with the Zoom links. Um, so check those out and join us March 27th for men's breakfast. Uh, March 14th, we will be having our, our next Young Adults Connect. So young adults, please tune in uh, and just time of connection uh, and gathering uh, over Zoom again. Uh, coming up tonight, uh, we will be having our prayer connect tonight at 7 with David Harita joining us. Uh, so please tune in tonight uh, for that prayer connect. Uh, it should be a wonderful time hearing from uh, the chairman of uh, our Fellowship Pacific uh, area. So take note of that. Uh, and don't forget, uh, as we've listened to in Guy's uh, update and announcement for the nominating team, so make sure you get your nominations in for the leadership team for this year. Uh, that is all. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day. Take care. Bye.